Very good to see everybody here this morning. I certainly want to encourage our visitors to fill out a visitor's card if you've not done so yet. We would love to get into contact with you and offer you any spiritual assistance that you have. If you have a need where you would like to sit down and study the Bible together to find out what it is that God has to say to you in His Gospel, then we'd love to do that. If you'd like prayers or encouragement, if you'd like to make confession, then we would love to get you to a point spiritually where you are close to God, where you have been forgiven, where you've obeyed the Gospel, and where you understand just where it is you're going to be when you die. There is certainly one being that knows where he's going to go at the end of all things, and that is Satan. There is going to be no surprise at all on the judgment day when Satan is cast into the eternal fires. He knows he's going to be punished. He knows he's defeated. His only hope at this point is to take as many of us with him. Now, where did Satan come from? That is the question that's often on people's minds. As a preacher, and I know that Alan can appreciate this as well, there are certain questions that we get asked more often than others. And more often than not, the questions that we get asked are questions that we don't have an answer to. People love to speculate about Satan. Where did he come from? What was his background? What was his history? Why did he fall if indeed he is some kind of a fallen angel? You know, and as I think about that, I, I, I don't have any biblical answer for you about where exactly Satan came from. Is he a created being of some kind? I suppose that he is since God created all things. Why did Satan fall? Why did Satan choose to sin? I don't know. I don't know. But I do have this answer for you. That if you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear a loud rattling downstairs and go down there to find a home invader, do you really care what his background story is? Do you care where he came from? All you care about is that he is there, that he is a threat, and that he must either be evaded from or defeated. I think it's the same, true with, the same with Satan. We need to stop worrying so much about what Satan's background is, or how Satan spends his days, or what exactly he is in terms of spiritual beings, or what he was before he fell. And we need to start worrying more about what he is doing right now, and where he wants to take us when all has been said and done and this life is finally over. You don't care about the life story of a home invader. You don't. You don't care what his name is or what his mother's maiden name is. You don't care what brought him to the point of home invasion. You just want to see him defeated or get yourself out of the dangerous situation yourself. One of the most clarifying passages on the subject of Satan, at least in the New Testament, is in 1 Peter chapter 5. Please notice with me, if you will, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now let's understand something, that everything we need to know about Satan is right here in two verses. Everything we need to know about him. First of all, he is an adversary, and let's put it plainly, he is an adversary. He's not a friend, he's not misunderstood. I remember when I was younger, when I first became a Christian, I had this strange idea that I talked to my parents, but I said, isn't it sad that Satan is at this point where all he wants to do is just tempt people to sin? Isn't that sad? If only somebody could reach Satan. Wouldn't it be great if Satan could be converted to Christianity? And then we no longer have an enemy. No, he's not just some misunderstood character in the cosmos, okay? Star Wars nerds, he's not Kylo Ren or anything like that. 
No, he is our adversary. Plain and simple, it is what he is, it's what he's always been, and it is what he will always be. I like the way that Jesus describes him in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus says. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Again, he's not just misunderstood. It's not just that there's truth somewhere in there. You just have to get past his exterior. You have to reach him somehow. There is no reaching Satan because at his core, fundamentally, he is bereft of all truth and he is a liar to the core. Whenever he speaks, Jesus says, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. The second thing that I notice about 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 is that he prowls about. Satan is not just some nebulous force. He's not just some kind of nameless, faceless force in the universe. That he actually has purpose and direction. He has movement and presence. He has goals. He prowls about like a roaring lion. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14, it says that Satan is able to disguise himself. And he promotes sin through very obvious means at other times, such as through false doctrine, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, or sexual temptation, or unwarranted anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity, it says in Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27, because he will take every opportunity. If, in fact, he is a predator prowling about, then all you have to do is let your guard down just for a single moment and he will strike. And it is in that single moment that he will strike. Satan's not going to get you when you're most prepared for him. Why would he waste his time with that? It's when you're least prepared and most distracted, when your guard is down and you're at ease. That's when he strikes. You know, we like nature shows. We like to watch nature shows. We like survival shows as well. One thing Rebecca can't do, she can't stand it, she does not like the hunt. You know, in every nature show on the Discovery Channel, the cutesy little bunny is just minding his own business. And out of nowhere comes the puma. She hates that part of it. The sweet little baby buffalo is just there in the meadows with his mom. And then the pack of wolves shows up. And she wants to change the channel. Now I. I don't like watching it either, so I can't just throw all the blame on Rebecca. I think most of us are probably like that, where we don't like the chase. We find that part of the nature show uncomfortable. When is it? When does the lion strike? When does the puma strike? When does the pack of wolves come at you? Is it when you're strong and prepared and alert and looking about you? Or is it in that moment when your head is down, lapping water from the pond? When you're at ease? Now, he prowls about, my friends. He prowls about. The other thing I want to point out is that he's seeking you. Because if Satan does, and I believe he does, if Satan does have presence and movement and purpose and goals and direction, and he's prowling about looking for someone to devour, well, he's looking for you then. It's so easy to just kind of generalize Satan and say, well, Satan is out there and, and Satan is tempting us and Satan is trying to bring us down. No, you know what? He's not trying to bring us down. He's not trying to tempt us. He's not just out there. No, he's tempting you. He's looking for you specifically, personally, individually. He's looking for you. We might, uh, we might feel that the devil sometimes is this fairly indiscriminate predator or he's some kind of a vague threat that Satan is somewhere out there hunting someone right now. Like we can hear the sound of the lion off in the distance, eerie as it is. No, he's hunting you. The Christian needs to be reminded that anybody or everybody is on the menu for tonight. And that includes me. 
Interestingly, the first epistle that Peter wrote was not written to unbelievers. Peter wasn't writing 1 Peter chapter 5 to sinners and unbelievers. No, he was writing 1 Peter chapter 5 to people like us, Christians, saints, the faithful. We are the ones who need to be on the alert. Sometimes we have this, this sense that Satan is out there in the world and, and Satan is messing up people's lives out there. You know what? Satan already has the world. 1 John chapter 5 says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He already has your unbelieving neighbor. He already has your atheist friend. He already has the world. You know who he's spending his time worrying about right now? It's us. We're the ones who have yet to be condemned. We're the ones who have yet to be added to His fold. And we're the ones who need to be worried about it. Who's He looking for? He's not looking for the lost. He's looking for us. And what a feather in His cap it would be if He could get us. If you think you're safe because you're an elder or a deacon, or because you've been a Christian for 30 years, or because you're a preacher, or because you're married to a preacher, or the child of a preacher. If you think that you're safe somehow, I think we need to switch around our thinking and realize we're probably the ones Satan wants the most. Imagine what it would do for Satan's cause if he could bring an elder down in a congregation. Imagine the destructive force it would be if he could infiltrate my life and what an embarrassment it would be for the church. What a discouragement it would be to bring down a Christian who's been a Christian for a long time. Someone who's a pillar in a congregation. So just because you think that you're safe and just because you think that you're secure doesn't mean you actually are. Satan would love nothing more than to bring down somebody like you or somebody like Simon Peter. What does it say in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 31, as Jesus is speaking to his apostle Peter? Simon, Simon, he says, Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He already had Judas, didn't he? He had Judas a long time ago. The very first coin that Judas took out of the coin purse, he already had Judas. But imagine what it would be like if Satan could get Peter. Oh, oh, he's just salivating at the opportunity for somebody like Peter. If I could bring Peter down, what would it do to the other disciples? Excluding Judas, the other ten, how would the other ten respond if I could bring Peter down? Isn't it great then that we have this story there in Luke chapter 22 of Peter being sifted like wheat. Okay, and sifting, by the way, not a pleasant process, okay? Peter being sifted like wheat, run through the meat grinder is maybe a modern term. And then years later, he writes 1 Peter chapter 5. And 1 Peter chapter 5, my friends, is from personal experience. Because at one point, if not many more, Peter could write in all honesty, that the devil was prowling about looking for me. And the devil specifically asked permission from God to come into my life and tear me down. Peter wrote from personal experience. He wrote from personal experience. It says in Matthew chapter 26 in verse 31, strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Strike down the best of us our leaders, our shepherds, our elders, their family members. We're all at danger, my friends. Every single one of us is in danger. Let me offer you some encouraging thoughts, though. That if you are going through a sifting period right now, if Satan has come into your life and you are presented daily with a struggle of some kind, discouragement or temptation, whatever it happens to be, try to find some comfort in the fact that Satan must think you're worth his time. I know that might not seem like much comfort while you're going through that sifting process, but at the very least, please, think of it in those terms. 
that if Satan is pestering you right now and he thinks that you should be brought down, well, he must think that you're worth his time. He must think you're worth his time. This makes it all the more imperative that we examine our own lives. That we think about our personal struggles, whatever they happen to be. Because what struggle you have is different for me. What struggle you have is maybe not what the struggle is for me. Your temptation is not my temptation. My temptation is not your temptation. Satan has a way with a personalizing these things, doesn't he? Much of the hardships that we read about in the Bible are very personal in nature. Satan likes to touch people where they are most vulnerable. To hurt them where it hurts the most. Think about situations for people like Judas. What tempted him the most? Or Nehemiah, what discouraged him the most? Or Job, his own children, his family members, his own wife deriding him and telling him to curse God. Adam and Eve, King Saul. There was a very personal touch to all of these things. As if Satan was tailor-making temptations just for them. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read about the armor of God. We mentioned it in our first lesson already. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, the reason why we put on the full armor of God is this. Put on the full armor of God that you may, may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. Scheming is not honest, is it? At its core, its, its nature is that it is dishonest. It's a promise that can't be kept. It's a prize that can't be won. So whatever your struggle happens to be, whatever temptation it is that works best on you, stop listening to the promise that it offers and start reading the fine print. It's a scheme. Let's read about the full armor of God because I think that we need to equip ourselves to handle what Satan throws at us. And the only way that we can is if we understand what God has given us at our disposal. So he says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle, he says in verse 12, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Satan's power. This world might be his playground, but he has many, many spiritual powers at his disposal. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist the devil in the day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. I love that there's some confidence there. Not that you'll be able to extinguish some of them or you'll have a 50-50 success rate. But when you put on the full armor of God, it doesn't matter what Satan throws at you. You have at your disposal all of the tools that you need to either defeat or escape. To defeat or escape. In addition, he says in verse 16, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and, the t and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here's a couple of things to think about. When you have your armor on, when you are fully clad in the armor of God, you must take it as a whole and not in pieces. Because if you leave one piece off, you know that's where Satan is going to find you. He'll find the chink in the armor. He'll find the vulnerability. He'll find the weakness. If you want to wear the armor of God, you also have to accept and embrace absolute truth. That's verse 14 of Ephesians 6. You have to accept that there is only one way to get to God. And there is only one truth out there, and it is His truth. You must accept that you have to wear this righteousness in a way that is not proud. Because who provided the armor for you? 
Not yourself, but God. The one who has the armor of God on knows that knowledge of the gospel prepares us for spiritual combat. That's verse 15. And if you're not prepared for spiritual combat, it means you've wasted your time with human wisdom, superficiality, or fake religion. When you have the armor of God on, it means that you're acknowledging the Spirit's influence in your life as well. That's verse 17. And you're not ashamed of the Spirit working through the Word of God, and you'll turn to your Bible for guidance without hesitation. And you will not be embarrassed by what the Bible has to say. And according to verses 18 and 19, which we didn't read, you'll lean heavily on prayer. Prayer is a powerful tool. And you'll be fully assured that God hears your cries and will deal with you bountifully and with loving kindness. Everybody's weakness is different, like I said. Some are mauled by upheaval in their personal lives while others are simply lulled into a false sense of security. Maybe what works for you is to turn your life upside down, to ruin your marriage, ruin your kids, take all your money away, lose your job, lose your house. But maybe the thing that Satan has to do is just let you live a happy life. Maybe that's all he has to do to get you condemned to hell, is to just let you have everything that you want. Because as long as you have everything you want, you'll never look for the thing you need most in God. Satan certainly takes a whatever works approach since the end result is always the same no matter how it is done. And the parable of the sower illustrates that. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 18, Jesus describes different kinds of soil. And I know normally we look at the parable of the sower as an evangelistic parable, but I want to look at it in terms of temptation and the eventual falling away of people into condemnation. We're all different kinds of soil. Okay? And we can choose what kind of soil we want to be. But the gospel comes into our lives. And for some, it is upheaval. For some, you fall away or you become condemned because of some great upheaval in your life because the birds come and they peck away at you and they take the gospel out of your heart. For other people, the cares and the concerns of this world is all it takes to bring you down. And eventually, you wither up and you die and you're condemned all the same. It doesn't matter what kind of soul you are. If the word never takes root, and you are not the soil that happily accepts the message of the gospel, the end result is the same. It's condemnation. It's condemnation. Let's go back to our nature shows. When we watch these nature shows, you see the predator and the prey interact with each other before the chase. You ever have that gut feeling that that zebra is just doomed? You know what's going to happen. That bunny's not going to get away from the puma. That zebra's not going to get away. Just doomed. And I don't turn the channel away. I suppose I don't mind it as much as other people do, but there's a moment there when the animal knows that it's defeated. And it's desperate. And finally resigned. Who do you see yourself as in this drama? Do you think that you're doomed and desperate? Are you the prey? And it's just a matter of time before Satan catches you and consumes you? Let me put it a different way. Satan is the doomed and desperate one. In the great drama of sin and temptation, of hell and heaven, Satan is the doomed and desperate one. Going back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it might seem like we're up against an unbeatable opponent. He's powerful and he possesses incredible influence in the world that we can't even imagine. 1 John 5 and verse 19. But in the great battle for our souls, we need to stop seeing ourselves as the doomed prey that is just sitting there inevitably bound for the devil's jaws. As Peter goes on to say in verse 9, but resist him 
firm in your faith. The very fact that God would write through the Apostle Peter that you can resist should be very encouraging to all of us. You can fight. And if you can't fight, you can escape because God does provide the way of escape when it comes to any temptation that we face. But you can't do it alone. When you resist Him firm in your faith, you must resist Him with God's help. Go to James chapter 4 and verse 7 and consider what James has to say. As he writes, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. What is the prerequisite for resisting the devil? What is the qualification there? Submit therefore to God. Submit to God. Bring Him into your life. Take His help. And you will be able to resist the devil. And again, just like Paul wrote to the Corinthians, if you can't resist, then at the very least, God will provide the way of escape from every temptation because no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. You can fight him or you can escape. You don't have to die. You don't have to be doomed and desperate. You don't have to look across the savanna at the roaring lion and feel a sense of resignation as if you are already in hell right now. And the more you resist him according to James, the more likely it is he'll eventually give up and leave you alone. Resist him. Draw near to God. When you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. He'll stop wasting his time and he'll go find somebody else to pester. An important part of winning any war, though, is the strategic withdrawal. Or what might appear to be retreat to some people. If your position is indefensible, then your only real option is to find better ground. Don't try to fight Satan on his terms. Don't fight him at the bar. Don't fight him with the mouse in your hand as you're clicking on the pornography. Don't fight him in the midst of a relationship that is destroying you. Don't fight him when you have left and abandoned God's people and no longer want to commune in fellowship with them. You think you can fight Satan on his terms? Out there? On that battleground? You think you can win that war? Remember, we're not bound for failure. The devil is. He's the one who's doomed. And the only way that you'll be doomed with him is if you let yourself be doomed with him. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, one of the great forgotten verses on the devil. We talk so much about his power and his influence, but in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, look at what Jesus has to say here about the devil's prospects, eternally speaking. He says, He will say to those on his left, speaking, of course, to those who, who did not share, who were not bountiful in their giving, who didn't give water and give food to those who had a need, to those who were unwilling to be charitable, to those on the left, the goats that have been separated from God. He says this, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I know I've said it before in other sermons, but I'll say it again. Hell wasn't made for you. It was made for Satan. You don't belong in hell. You don't belong in hell. But you will go there if you choose his side. Revelation 21 and verse 10 similarly describes the fate of the devil, that great serpent of old, when all things are finished, when every temptation has been thrown out there and every sin has been committed, when everyone who believes with the whole heart has been baptized in the body of Jesus Christ, and at the end of all things, where is Satan going, according to Revelation 21? He is going to hell. He's doomed. And he's just flailing his arms wildly right now hoping to capture any one of us who's let his or her guard down. Go to heaven, my friends. 
go to heaven. The only thing keeping you from heaven is whatever you've allowed Satan to do in your life. Resist him, firm in your faith, and start drawing near to God today. The first step, my friends, is to believe that He sent His Son Jesus to come to this world to die for our sins and to be raised up to defeat the one tool of Satan's that seems to flummox us the most, which is death. And now that Satan's been defeated and death along with him, what prevents you from becoming part of the body of Christ but your willingness to be baptized? Whatever need you might have, please, come forward as we stand and sing.